Schools are problematic. That's by design. They're created for a very specific purpose, to control. And I believe that we can do better. But let's find out where modern schooling even came from. People have been grouped and educated together in preparation for adult life since the very earliest human civilizations. But state schooling really began with Plato, who believed that education and schools were the most important function of the state. In the Republic, Plato said that the state should take responsibility for training children from the age of three to guide citizens toward an ideal conception of justice and to the social class and occupation best suited for them. In essence, Plato believes that the education system served to screen and place citizens into designated boxes. The school should be designed by the state to perpetuate the state. Later on, after the church took charge of education, learning became fixed within the boundaries of the church's interests and doctrines. So no vengeance, philosophy or science would contradict the faith. Modern schooling really came around after the Prussian government developed a compulsory state-controlled education system. Joan Fichte, one of the leaders in the push for state schooling, argued that Prussia was defeated so severely by Napoleon's France because its citizens lacked cohesion, a commitment to the nation and a willingness to sacrifice for its good. Fichte believed that schools should be used to create a compliant citizen who would be used to following orders, willingly submissive to a larger authority, faithful to the virtues of the state, and familiar with hierarchy. In the end, Prussian educational theorists created a model for schooling built around centrally controlled curriculums, constant fragmentation of days into changing classes at the sound of a bell, obedience, and teacher-directed classroom groupings. At the heart of the system was the primacy of the state. Children both belonged to and were the responsibility of the state. Frederick Winslow Taylor, father of scientific management, was highly influential in the development of the education system. His ideas were adopted, interpreted, and applied by school administrators all over the world. In a speech to the High School Teachers Association of New York City regarding the application of scientific management to schools, the purpose was described as follows. 1. To increase the efficiency of the laborer, i.e. the people. 2. To increase quality of the product, i.e. the pupil. And 3. Thereby, to increase the amount of output and value to the capitalist. Alexander Inglis, assistant professor of education at Harvard University in the 1920s, made it perfectly clear that compulsory schooling was intended to be just what it had been for Prussia in the 1820s, a sort of surgical incision into the prospective unity of the underclasses. Divide children by subject, by age grading, by constant rankings on tests, and by many other more subtle means, and it was unlikely that the ignorant masses of mankind, separated in childhood, would ever reintegrate into a dangerous hole. English breaks down this purpose, the actual purpose of modern schooling, into six basic functions. 1. The Adaptive Function Schools to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. So no critical judgment. No useful or interesting material. After all, how can you test for reflexive obedience until you know whether you can make kids learn and do foolish and boring things? 2. The conformity function. Make children as alike as possible. People who conform are predictable, which is great for manipulation and control of the masses. 3. The diagnostic function. Schools meant to determine each student's proper social role. So basically, your permanent record accumulating data about your habits. 4. The differentiating function. Once your social role has been diagnosed, children are to be sorted and trained for their destination and not one step further. Their personal best is irrelevant. 5. The selective function. Applying Darwinian natural selection to, quote-unquote, improve the breeding stock by tagging the unfit with poor grades, poor placement, and punishments so their peers will see them as inferior. And six, lastly, propedeutic function. The system is meant to propagate itself. It requires propagators, caretakers, an elite group of children who will be taught how to continue the system of control, how to watch over and control the population deliberately dumbed down and declawed so that the government may proceed unchallenged and corporations may never want for obedient labor. It is a philosophically platonic, Prussian-inspired compulsory school system that exists today, worldwide. 
schools are a mere tools built for the maintenance and proliferation of state ideologies and patriotism. Peter Jalbaru said it best. The most important lesson consistently taught by schools under the state are to obey arbitrary authority, to accept the imposition of other people's priorities in our lives, and to stop daydreaming. When children start school, they are self-guided, curious about the world they live in, and believe everything is possible. When they finish, they are cynical, self-absorbed, and used to dedicating 40 hours of their week to an activity they never chose. They are also likely to be miseducated about a number of things, perhaps unaware that the majority of human societies throughout history have been egalitarian and stateless, that the police have only recently become an important and supposedly necessary institution, that the government has a track record of torture, genocide and repression, that their lifestyles are destroying the environment, that their food and water are poisoned, or that there is a history of resistance waiting to be uncovered in their very own town. As I'm sure it's clear to you now, schools probably need to be cancelled. Schools focus on testing, evaluation, control and authority is heavily detrimental to the development of children and young adults. The education industry undermines student health and contributes to an unequal society. In Trantabago and other places, the separation between prestige schools and government assisted schools leads to the propagation of a separation of the classes and a disparity in quality of education and availability of opportunities. Children are sorted into categories based on what teachers think they are capable of, affecting the rest of their life. Teachers wield an unreasonable amount of power in this regard. The school system also gives everybody standardized exams. Giving all students the same test is inherently unequal, as every person has a different family background, a different life story, and different levels of access to extra education. The grading system in school also teaches young kids that some people are better than others, that some people are smart and others are stupid, that some people are entitled to a great future but others aren't, that some people are the masters and others are the slaves. The system nurtures inequality and inferiority superiority complexes. Plus, heavily religious involvement in schools also lends itself to serious issues with the continuation of colonial thinking, including sexism and racism in strict dress codes, bullying, homophobia and transphobia, the segregation of genders, the suppression of certain subjects including sex education, and the further ends of hierarchy. The current school system is based on the rigorous memorization of facts. And because competition for university enrollment and employment is so hard, schools aim to teach their students maximum information in minimum time, placing excessive stress on students. In a system where people are measured by the grades they receive, trust from exams, homework, revision, and uncertain future cause anxiety and may lead to stress-related psychological disorders, serious levels of depression, and even attempted suicide. Students suffering from stress notice constant fatigue, forgetfulness, poor appetite, social withdrawal, increased heart rate, blurred vision, muscle pain for no apparent reason, and headaches. Over long periods of time, stress can cause high risk of coronary disease, obesity, increased blood pressure, weakened immune system, and death. Schools don't account for different learning styles and intelligences. What level of consideration is given to verbal, visual, auditory, physical, logical, social, solitary, or combination learning styles? What is prioritized and why? There's so many intelligences too, like musical, kinesthetic, interpersonal, linguistic, logical, naturalistic, intrapersonal, and visual. What do we value and consider, and why? Schools don't even teach kids the skills they need for the crappy jobs they'll end up working. Most of this, people teach themselves, or learn among friends and peers. That is to say, the school of life is already anarchistic. So what does anarchism have to say about education? Leo Tolstoy, Christian anarchist and celebrated novelist, described education as the tendency of one man to make another just like himself. Education is culture under restraint. Education is force, where the only subjects taught are those deemed necessary by the educator. Tolstoy's school was centered around the idea of free inquiry. 
since he believed that teaching and instruction were only means for cultural transmission when they were free, students should be left to learn what they wanted to learn, directing both themselves and the kinds of classes they wanted taught. Many anarchists have set up non-hierarchical schools where teachers served as aides, helping the students learn and explore their chosen subjects. Anarchist modern schools helped educate thousands of students. In 1911, the first modern school in the US was founded in New York City by Emma Goldman, Alexander Bergman, Voltairine de Clair, and other anarchists. It lasted for several decades, eventually moving out of New York City during a period of intense political repression and became the center of a rural commune. In 1969, Native American activists under the name Indians of All Nations occupied the abandoned Alcatraz Island for 19 months, revitalizing indigenous culture and rejecting colonial control. During the early period, the Indian occupiers organized a school that taught indigenous history and culture from their own perspective, without the racist propaganda that filled the textbooks of the government schools. Today, anarchists continue to organize free schools. For example, in anti-authoritarian Albany Free School, no one is turned away for financial reasons. The diverse student body has no curriculum or compulsory classes, and the school operates according to the philosophy as follows. Trust children and they will learn. Because when you entrust kids with their own so-called education, which is not a thing after all, but rather an ever-present action, they will learn continually, each in their own way and rhythm. The school organizes a small organic farm in the city, which provides another important learning opportunity for students. Students also work with community service projects such as soup kitchens and daycare centers. Despite financial and other limitations, they have succeeded admirably. In Brazil, the MST, also called the Landless Workers Movement, has focused on education in the settlements they have created on occupied land. Between 2002 and 2005, the MST claims to have taught over 50,000 landless workers how to read. 150,000 children are now enrolled in 1,200 different schools they have built on their settlements, and they have also trained over 1,000 educators. The MST schools are free from state control, so communities have the power to decide what their children are taught and can develop alternative methods of education, as well as curricula free of the racist, patriotic and capitalist values that are part and parcel of public education. It is my belief and the belief of countless other leftist thinkers that knowledge should be free. The patriotic, degrading, manipulative and mind-numbing forms of education that currently exist cannot continue and can never help people reach their fullest potential. Children don't need structure. Children need freedom. The freedom to play. The freedom to enjoy. The freedom to test. The freedom to try. My ideal education system consists of the wider society helping the youngest to pursue their education unhindered. Let children craft. Let children build, let children draw, let children write, let children speak, let children choose. Instead of teachers and compulsory classes, we should have aids that guide children in surviving childhood, expressing emotions healthily, developing their unique creative potentials, taking charge of their own health or caring for sick people, dealing with gendered violence, domestic abuse or alcoholism, standing up to bullies, communicating with parents, understanding their sexuality in a respectful way, finding meaningful work and safe housing, and other skills young people need to live. There must also be an end to segregated gendered schooling. Everyone should be able to learn to cook and sew. Everyone should be able to learn to fix a toilet, mount an electrical installation, repair a bicycle or a car engine, plaster a wall or work with wood. Knowledge should be freeing, not constricting. Grades and testing and standardization Ignore the complexity and diversity of thoughts and development. They must all be abolished. Life is so much more than the dismal rat race we're being forced to run. It's time to break out and be free. My imagination may be limited, so think for yourself. What do you think education could look like? No one is free until everyone is free. Free the youth now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And leave a comment letting me know what topic you'd like me to discuss next. Peace out.